Okay, thanks for being here. It's a great pleasure to moderate this panel. Uh, the topic is a bit technical, containers and how they're going to change the server landscape. But we, are try we try to keep it as understandable as possible because I imagine not of you uh, can be developers and also for the benefit of the moderator, which <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't understand that everything probably. So I, I know you're both two very well-respected and uh, well-known professionals, but uh, maybe for a start, uh, could you just briefly introduce yourself, Mark? For sure. So I'm Mark Krasinovich. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Microsoft Azure. And in that role, I'm responsible for technical strategy and architecture of the Azure platform. I work deeply on our container initiatives across containers for Windows Server, as well as our container service, containers as a service offer that we've recently announced. OK, great. Yes. And uh, good morning, I'm Alex Polvi, the CEO of CoreOS. Um, CoreOS is an early stage company, very focused in this space of containers and distributed systems. Um, outside of CoreOS, I'm also on the board of the Internet Security Research Group, which uh, founded a project called Let's Encrypt, which has been getting lots of attention recently around internet security and providing free TLS certificates for the web. Okay, I'll start with some questions. So, uh, Alex, can you explain us uh, briefly what our containers are and why the, are they important uh, for the server uh, infrastructure? Sure. So there's the technical aspect of a container, which um, I think the simplest way to put it is, you know how there's apps on your phones? Um, for server people, for data centers, a container is an app in the data center. It's a, it's a logical unit that can be deployed onto server infrastructure. Um, but this, the movement and the change that's happening right now is, is beyond just that app. It's also this aspect of how applications are deployed and delivered in a way to your data center that's dynamically scheduled and fault tolerant and has all these properties that we've seen happen uh, with the web scale giants, folks like Microsoft and Google and Facebook and Twitter. The way that they run infrastructure is really what's being modeled um, right now as part of this containers, container movement. And that's where projects like you know, Kubernetes and Mesos and those things fold into it as well, which is part of the discussion just as much as projects like Docker, um, which really kind of triggered this container, container aspect. Okay, and what are Microsoft solutions in this space, Mark? Sure. So uh, we have a few. So in, in the context of Azure, we work closely with companies like Docker to mm -hmm. make sure that Docker extensions work inside of, or Docker containers work inside of our Linux virtual machines. When somebody goes to Azure and deploys a virtual machine, they can get the Docker engine pre-installed in it. Then we also work closely with companies like Mesosphere as well, and with Google even, to make sure that container orchestration solutions work on our platform. And so. We've got turnkey solutions where you can go to Azure and with a single click deploy a Mesos cluster or a Kubernetes cluster and deploy to them. Then in the context of Windows, which we, uh, as most people know, containers really started on Linux, but we've been working on container technologies in Windows as well as Windows Server 2016, working closely with Docker to make sure that the container technologies in, that are coming in Windows work well with the Docker ecosystem. So that's another aspect of our work. And then finally, I mentioned that we've got a container as a service offering that we recently announced that's coming to Azure, where we've partnered with Mesosphere to allow managed Mesos clusters to be easily deployed. Mm -hmm. And again, that will support both Linux and Windows as soon as Windows Server containers are available. Okay. Uh, Alex, uh, I know you, uh, the security for you is a key team. As you said, you're also active in Alex Encrypt uh, and other initiatives. Uh, in terms of security, do you think that containers could have an edge over other solutions? I do. I think it's a bit indirect from what you might be expecting. Um, containers are one in isolation technology, and that's what gets a lot of the discussion. Um, but isolation is only one aspect of security. Uh, the biggest piece that's th that the security discussion, I think, um, focused around containers is your ability to service your applications. And most, most attacks and most threats to your environment are, are when you get compromised because you have an out-of-date application or, or something like that. And so the nice piece about containers is it gives you this consistent environment that you can reliably deploy against, thus making your infrastructure more serviceable and more secure that way. So it's less of a discussion about is you know, container better than a virtual machine in terms of isolation. That's kind of irrelevant here. It's about a different model of running your infrastructure, which is innately more secure. Do you agree about that? Yeah, so um, one aspect of containers that provides further agility is that they're 
un unlike virtual machines, which obviously given the name is virtualizing a machine for an operating system to run in, you can think of containers as a virtualized operating system. Mm -hmm. So each container launches, it's got its own private view of an operating system that's given to it through the namespace and resource isolation and virtualization technologies of an operating system, but underneath they're sharing a common kernel. And it's this common kernel that provides this kind of efficiency, but it also means that they're sharing this kernel. And that, if, if you're talking about in the context of code and the trustworthy, trustworthiness of that code with respect to that kernel or with respect to other containers on the same operating system, then the kernel itself might not provide enough isolation to really uh, yeah. have confidence yeah. that, that somebody can't break out of their container and, mm -hmm. and so you impact the, next, the host. The next layer. Yeah, and so this is one place where you see uh, cloud providers like us offer vir virtual machines mm -hmm. as an encapsulating container where you can put containers from the same company, ones that have uh, within the same trust boundary together inside the same virtual machine. Mm -hmm. And then in the context of server, like I mentioned, some of the work we're doing is to bring container technologies to servers, and we've got a type of container called Windows Server Containers, which is like the Linux containers, which share a common operating system kernel mm -hmm. underneath them. But we've also got another container type called Hyper-V Containers, and this one really was somewhat motivated by Azure's own needs for a lightweight container in which to host what we call hostile multi-tenant code, and that means code from customers that are using the platform where we can't trust that they're not going to try to intentionally break out of their container mm -hmm. and, and, and get to a host or get to another container. So with Hyper-V containers, the difference between that and, and Windows Server containers mm -hmm. is that they each have their own dedicated kernel and they run in a, a partition that is protected by virtualization technologies okay. provided by Hyper-V. Mm -hmm. And that provides a very strong isolation get boundary with both re with respect to namespace as well as with respect to a dedicated kernel and resource isolation and that is what we can confidently host untrusted code in. Okay. Uh, aside from the technical uh, theoretical part, could you mm, both provide some use cases of industries or companies that adopted the solutions and uh, have some benefits from them? We, we could start with. Sure. A lot of this originates from the, um, the web service providers themselves. So the companies that are adopting it tend to be um, companies that are developing web services in, in some form. That's a very popular use case uh, for containers. And um, the thing that we're seeing is for the first time, uh, companies, many, many companies need to be web service providers, ones that traditionally didn't need to be. You know, this means banks, it means telecoms, it's, it's um, you know, e-commerce, but in kind of a different way, um, are, are becoming web service providers. They're providing APIs into their internal platforms um, and are servicing things like their mobile apps or servicing, you know, their websites and so on with that. Um, and so containers have found a, a very natural home there, considering that they've been deployed, you know, first from the web service providers. That's where this all originated from the beginning. So it kind of makes sense that that's where it would end up. And just where technology is today, and every company has to provide web services of some form to do business in 2015. And so thus you see it. Now, why did the service providers do it in the first place? Well, you get much better utilization. Um, your, your infrastructure itself, the, the raw servers, whether they're virtual machines or they're bare metal servers, become much more fungible. They're, they're just standard commodity machines now. Um, and you can much more easily build applications that are highly available and fault tolerant. You can kill any machine at any time and your applications keep running. Okay. So service providers, yeah. and what, to, what about Microsoft? Yeah, what so kind of companies do you service? So the same thing, I mean, uh, the same thing. It's the web scale kind of companies that have really pioneered the use of containers. But Microsoft internally, uh, like, I, like uh, I've just mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. Microsoft, on Windows doesn't have, didn't have container technologies until Windows Server 2016, but that didn't stop us from going and implementing container-like solutions on top of Windows for our own mm -hmm. cloud platforms and services. And as part of that, what's really kind of driven this and what's very synergistic with containers is the rise of microservices-based application architectures. And so Alex was uh, talking about that a little bit early, Mesos. And, Kubernetes really are foundations for microservices okay. applications, where you take an application and explode it into constituent components, and then those constituent components each are effectively little mini applications mm -hmm. that can be independently updated, independently scaled, have the fault tolerance capabilities because they're scaled out, 
And having an application model that combines containers as the deployment mechanism and management mechanism for those pieces, as well as the overall microservice application model, mm. is really what allows you to get to high degrees of efficiency, high degrees of, of agility in rolling out application updates. Uh, in many cases, people take this microservice concept and say each of these microservices that make up a larger application should be developed by a pizza box size team, mm. and you should be able to rewrite the whole thing from scratch in two months. This is kind of the, the ideal view of microservices. But when you get to that state, which is a state where all of application development is going, really, ultimately, when people talk about cloud native and the trends toward cloud native, mm. that is what they're talking about. And, and so while it starts with web scale companies, it's going to penetrate the entire enterprise. Okay. And what about uh, the open source part? What is the role of open source in this uh, context? Sure. A any, any basic internet infrastructure will become open source. In fact, it tends to start with the most difficult parts first um, and work its way out towards reverse order. And so, you know, we've, we've now, we have the Linux kernel, uh, we have all the web servers, we have databases. Uh, virtualization itself has gone open source in a pretty big way. Um, and containers are, are the next logical step in terms of um, you know, moving up that chain of, of value um, in, into open source. And I believe over time, you know, any piece of plumbing for, for building, building the internet will go open source, um, or it already has in some form. It might not be widely adopted, but it probably already has. Mm. And so containers, I think, are part of that, that bigger trend of the, the you know, most difficult parts of, of running infrastructure going open source over time. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, Microsoft is mo mostly well known for its proprietary solution, but I guess you also do something in this uh, open source field, right? Yeah, in fact, I was just at uh, a conference called All Things Open about mm. two weeks ago talking about how deeply Microsoft works with open source across all its products and in many different ways. And when it comes to containers, I mentioned our work with Docker. So making sure that our containers work well with Docker. So the, the Docker interfaces, which are, are mm. open, those are ones that we make sure and ported with Docker to Windows Server to manage mm -hmm. the Windows Server containers. And then the Azure Container Service I mentioned, one of our goals there was also to be open rather than create some new container orchestration solution mm. there, rather embrace the open ecosystem. And again, that's the partnership with Mesosphere to have that container service be built on Mesos, which is really the orchestration technology we see as the most mature. It's the one that's used by companies like Airbnb and Twitter. Mm. And that one, with partnership with Mesosphere, uh, this ability to create a Mesos cluster on the, on the fly using open technologies, meaning that companies are comfortable with taking a dependency on that. It, if they're very open source focused, they can deploy that in their own data centers. They can deploy that. Uh, Mm. easily in Azure and take advantage of there or even another cloud provider. So it gives them that, that freedom. And that was one of our guiding principles, one of our uh, higher order uh, aspects of making that decision to go with Mesos. Oh. It's interesting. Uh, I'm curious. I'm a journalist. So this, uh, um, this approach by Microsoft uh, with uh, collaborating with the open source community, do you think will expand in the future? Oh, yeah, I mean, obviously, we've been on this journey towards embracing open source, I think a um, real milestone in that, this kind of change at Microsoft that's been going on for several years was last fall when Satya Nadella, our CEO, mm. stood up on stage at a, at a conference in, or a Microsoft event in, the, in Silicon Valley with a Microsoft Loves Linux sign behind him. I, like I said, I, that kind of woke people up to, it's, a, it's, an, it's, it's a different strange. Microsoft Wait, than the one. Let's just think about this for a second. Yeah. Let's just think about it for one second. Microsoft loves Linux. Think, come on. <laughs> like, it's pretty amazing how far yes. we've come. I mean, there, it's, it's, I think Microsoft has been amazing in terms of being very progressive towards open source and moving to like where we're seeing infrastructure. And um, when I got started in this whole space, it's very much an open, you know, I consider myself an open source zealot, for better or for worse. And to be able to go and speak with Microsoft about Microsoft and Linux coming together, I mean, it's a big event. And here we are yeah, again. And we partner it's, closely <laughs> with you guys, too. Definitely. Core OS yeah. is one of the distros that we offer in Azure. And so, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a surprising evolution in some respects, but uh, it's a good one, probably. And uh, last but not least, uh, so these containers, do you think, are going to become more widespread? What, uh, what's the future of containers, according to you, Alex? 
Yeah, I think it's I think it's going nowhere. Next year we will be talking about something else, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, I think we we've seen we've already seen the future, and it's what the web scale folks are doing, and they've been doing this for a long time. This is not brand new technology. It's just only been needed by these hyperscale um, hyperscale companies. But but now more and more companies are needing it. The general growth of the internet, the general shift to web services for for you know more common um, companies, um, and so. Uh, I think it's definitely going there. We already have proof points that that's where the future is. It's what the most advanced use cases were already doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so containers, you know, we expect to be one of the most widely deployed ways of running infrastructure. You know, what's in the, the, in the short term from the community so far, from the network administrators, or what kind of feedback do you receive when they when you propose this new <laughs> approach? Sure, it's. You know, it's a little bit of a change. This whole style of running infrastructure is a little bit of a change. And change is hard, especially with servers. I mean, state of the art in your data center is get it running and don't touch it. Mm -hmm. um, and so to cause change is difficult. But everybody's infrastructure is so on fire that they realize we need to, we need to have a better solution. We need to change it in a pretty big way. And containers really represent that, that change, that, that shift in terms of how, how companies should run their data center. And, and it's very exciting. It reminds me of the early days of cloud um, in terms of when cloud was first released, you know, there was lots of excitement, lots of conferences and things yeah. talking about it. And it's very similar uh, in spirit with containers. And uh, you, Mark, what do you envision for the future of this technology? Yeah, so, so like Alex, I mean, this, this thing, we're just at the beginning of this container revolution. And I can't talk to a single customer that comes to, to Microsoft without them saying, I wanted to understand what you're doing about containers and what you're doing about microservices. And so all of this, like I said, is, is connected together. And one of the places where I think the next big place you're going to see a lot of innovation is in that microservices platform layer. Microsoft, we have our own microservices platform. We've built our own hyperscale services on top of service fabric that we're bringing out. But you're going to see a lot of innovation by different companies in the open on microservices platforms that provide you the seamless separation of application from the underlying infrastructure, packaging up those applications, those microservices as containers, and then providing full end-to-end -end lifecycle management over a microservice application. So the role of Microsoft uh, in the future, what do you envision will be like more of a partner, of a driving force? What kind of a role could you Microsoft? For Microsoft? Yeah. I think Microsoft plays a, a few things. One is that we want to bring our own technology innovations out and make them available for our customers. And the other one is we want to enable innovations that come from other companies and the open source world mm -hmm. to be first class in, on Microsoft products, whether that's my Windows Server, like in the case of Mesosphere and Docker being ported to Windows Server, or in the case of Azure and making sure that Linux runs great on Azure, that Mesos runs great on Azure, that even Kubernetes runs great on Azure, anything that our customers want to do we want to have a first class place for them for it. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks a lot. Well, uh, there could be many more questions, but I think our time is more or less running out. So thanks a lot for staying and being with us. And uh, thanks a lot. Bye. <laughs> OK. Thank you.